Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Lung Health Foundation, welcome to Bridging Gaps in Asthma Care. Uh, thank you for being here uh, and sharing your time with us today to help us create a world where everyone can breathe easier. I'm Chris Langwa. I'm the Director of Program Planning and Operations here at the Lung Health Foundation, uh, and I'll be your host for this session. Um, don't worry, that doesn't mean too much talking for me. I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists today, uh, and then I'll come back at the end to, to facilitate the Q&A session. Um, so please use the chat to get in on the conversation and pose any questions or perspectives you have in the Q&A section. Uh, and as I said, we will have Q&A at the end. Uh, with that, I'm pleased to introduce Jeffrey Beach, Susan Wasserman, Susan Valkovec, and Josh Rayom. Jeffrey Beach is president and CEO of Asthma Canada. He's a passionate leader in the Canadian nonprofit sector with more than 25 years of experience in management, community, and fund development. He is driven to help others and thrives on developing and executing strategies to empower people to reach their full potential despite health and social challenges. Susan Wasserman obtained her MSc and medical degree from McGill University in Montreal. She is currently professor of medicine in the Division of Allergy slash Clinical Immunology at McMaster University in Hamilton and director of the Adverse Reactions Clinic at the Firestone Institute of Respiratory Health. Um, uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in, in Hamilton, Ontario, and former president of both Ontario and Canadian Societies of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Susan Belkovec is a registered therapist, registered respiratory therapist and certified asthma educator at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. She educates families of children who have been hospitalized or been to the intensive care unit for asthma. She collaborates with a multidisciplinary team regarding asthma management and with the families during scheduled visits in the ambulatory asthma clinic. Josh Rayum has lived uh, with severe asthma since childhood and was diagnosed with a fatty liver uh, as a young man. Josh turned his health around with three-year lifestyle change that culminated with him completing a marathon in 2023 with Team Asthma Canada. He shares his journey on social media, advocates for Asthma Canada, and raises awareness about asthma while working uh, as an exploration geoscience coordinator. So thanks so much for, for being with us uh, here, uh, and I'll turn it over to, to our panelists. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thank you everyone for joining and, and choosing to attend our session here today. We're so happy to be here and, and really glad to be involved with uh, Better Breathing Week 2024. Um, so just to, to start off with just a little bit of background information about Asthma Canada. As Chris mentioned, I am the uh, president and CEO, and we have um, others who are part of this panel who are involved at different levels of the organization. Asthma Canada is the only Canadian nonprofit health organization that's solely dedicated to uh, and focused on asthma and respiratory allergies. So we're a national health charity. Uh, we're patient-driven, patient-centric. We're this year in 2024 celebrating 50 years since the uh, founding of Asthma Canada, which was originally the Asthma Society of Canada, rebranded it as, as Asthma Canada about five, six years ago. And our focus, our priority on our, is really on three mission areas. So the first is providing education and support for patients and caregivers in the form of web-based resources, webinars, print resources that you can find in clinics across the country. Uh, we also operate an asthma and allergy helpline that's available to anyone. It's staffed by certified respiratory educators. We also are involved in funding and participating in research uh, and we have a national research program that funds various uh, programs that are designate, that are designed to uh, advance our understanding of the disease and uh, ultimately help uh, patients with better treatment options. And then finally, we also are involved in advocacy, both in terms of patient access to care and to medication that they need in order to em empower themselves to live better with their disease, and also in environmental advocacy, because we know that the, the air we breathe is important to all of us, but especially for those that are suffering from lung health conditions like asthma, uh, we know that that's an important element of our work as well. So we advocate for clean energy and clean air initiatives uh, in addition to patient priorities. So for more information, check us out. We're at asthma.ca or you can get in touch with me or any members of our team. With that, I'd like to call on Josh uh, as our first speaker today. Josh has joined us to advocate for better asthma care and to share his story that illustrates the need that exists to address the factors that lead to many Canadians living with severe asthma, including long wait times and access to specialist care. So I'll turn it over to you, Josh, to share your story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm 33 years old. Um, I feel like I could talk about my story all day, but I'll try to wrap it up uh, into something a little more concise. 
Uh, so I grew up in the Annapolis Valley, Nova Scotia, um, in a valley, uh, essentially a cesspool for, you know, whatever's kind of going on uh, in that area. Um, and, and for myself, I have very allergenic asthma. And I didn't know this as a kid. And my asthma is very affected by weather. So perhaps not the best place to grow up. Um, things weren't so easy for us. Uh, on top of poverty uh, and consequently cold winters without heat, frozen pipes, little food. Um, we were a family with four kids and my mom was a single mom. Uh, life was as, you know, as tough as it was, it, very busy. Uh, but as if that scenario didn't create enough obstacles or hurdles, um, I was severe asthmatic. I still am and very sick at the time. Uh, one of my, out of my typical school year, sorry, uh, I'd miss somewhere around three months and I'd spend the bulk of that time in hospitals. Um, that's what defined my childhood, unfortunately. And that's what I think of when I think about my childhood, as I think about all the time I spent in hospitals all the help that I needed and all, all the people that did help me along the way. Um, and probably my, my sibling's childhood as well, because of course I have my mom uh, with me all the time. She doesn't want to leave me. She's a single mom. She's going to stay with her sick child. So it was, a, it was a really tough childhood. Um, and there was, there was this vicious cycle, which I didn't understand at the time, but I certainly understand now. Um, I would be in the hospital for, you know, anywhere from a week to two weeks at a time, my typical visit, um, you know, a few days into my visit, I would I would get better, um, and then I would be released. Um, unfortunately, I would be released to to that house in that valley, that farmhouse, 150 year old farmhouse in that valley. Um, you know, with animals, uh, dogs and cats, and it really wasn't understood how those allergies would affect me, or, or at least not communicated with me, and and my family wasn't educated on it. So, I was released to the same house every single time. I would get sick you know, just after a few days and I would, I would deal with it. I would, I would survive with it. I would go to school. I would take my puffer every hour. You know, I, I certainly didn't abide by the one puff every four hours. It just wasn't realistic for me. Um, until the point where I would either collapse or I would admit to my mom, I'm really not feeling well. We have to go in. And of course we go to the hospital. I'd be released and the exact same thing would happen. When I turned 18 years old, I moved um, and I noticed the impact right away. I was out of that valley. Um, I was in Ontario at the time, uh, and, and that did help a lot. And of course, I didn't have I didn't have dogs. I didn't have cats at the time. I was living in 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 a you know residence in college. Things instantly got better. Not a hundred percent, but things that did instantly get better. Now, fast forward a little bit more. Um, you know, being told essentially my entire life, I should probably abstain from from running any kind of physical activity that's gonna um, impact my lungs uh, for the worse. So I, I abstain from that sort of activity. I eventually gained some weight. I was diagnosed with a fatty liver and I realized that I needed to make a big lifestyle change. So that's what I did. I began running every day. Um, you know, what started off as 200 meters at a time, I'd stop, take my inhaler. Um, the next day I'd return 300 meters, stop, take my inhaler, but I always made it further and further. And I felt like what I was doing was conditioning my lungs in a sense. And it was something I was never told about that I could condition my lungs. I could get fitter and healthier and it's actually gonna help my lungs. And that's exactly what was happening. Um, around that time, you know, also losing 80 pounds, which, which was great. And, and, you know, really helping my fatty liver. Um, I, I ran a marathon, um, you know, with asthma Canada on my back as team asthma, it felt amazing. Something I never would have thought was possible as a kid. And I, and I was able to accomplish this feat. And the reason why I wanted to do this feat, um, is because I feel to an asthmatic, you think of a marathon as something so far out there. Um, it's just so high up there. You're never going to reach it. And I wanted to prove that I could reach it. And when I started realizing the effects of, of running, you know, I, I started sharing it with as many people as I could. I started a social media account telling everybody about how, how life-changing it was for me and, and helping asthmatics where I can. Now, I know I'm only one person, um, but essentially that's why we're here today, right? To, to get other people that can do essentially what I'm doing, can really empower asthmatics and, and help them out and, and educate them and their families. Um, when I was a kid as well, um, quite, quite long ago now, um, I had, I had the option, uh, to, to be on a biomedication that could potentially help me. Um, uh, unfortunately insurance didn't cover it. Um, and we didn't have the money to pay for it. So that was, that was never an option. So instead, you know, same thing every single day, uh, asthma, asthma, asthma. Um, and, and that's where we are today. So where I'm, where I'm kind of explaining my story to everyone, 
and I'm trying to help, I can go days now without taking my inhaler. Of course, you know, aside from my controlled medications, which I think is really important. But the fact is I am on a stack of controlled medications that help now because I've conditioned my lungs to do so. And, and I think getting that education out there to people, uh, to families, to patients, um, even, you know, to healthcare providers, I think is absolutely crucial um, in, in, in kind of changing what we're looking at and, and ensuring asthmatics are, are properly cared for. Thanks so much, Josh, and and uh, just shared my screen here, so hopefully everyone can see some pictures of you. Uh, as you uh, mentioned, you did run the uh, Toronto Waterfront Marathon back in October as uh, the captain of Team Asthma. We really appreciate that, and thank you so much for sharing your story, not only today, but really in coming forward and helping us with our advocacy and, and education initiatives. And I know from talking to other uh, patients uh, that you're an inspiration to others as well. So we really appreciate that. And we'll come back to you in a bit to ask you to weigh in on some of the other uh, questions that we'll have for our panelists today. Uh, so today's uh, session, before we get into any further discussion, just want to mention that uh, we do we are showing here some uh, disclosures uh, for myself and Dr. Wasserman. Uh, Susan and Josh did not report any disclosures. And the learning objectives are here. They, those were uh, sort of advertised in advance, so I'm not going to read them. Uh, but uh, before I launch into the first question for the panel, just a bit of background information. Josh's story really helps to illustrate why we're here and why the Delphi study that this session is centered around was conducted in the first place. So we know that there are over 4 million Canadians that live with asthma, uh, about 900,000 to, 900, to a million of them are children. It's estimated that about 5 to 10% of the asthma population has severe asthma. And we know that although that represents a smaller portion of the overall number of patients, that people with severe and uncontrolled asthma represent about 50% of all asthma direct related costs. So the, uh, the, it, it's really important, obviously, from a health system perspective that we do better. And we know that we can, and we're going to talk about some of the recommendations that the Delphi study has uh, put forward to help us do that. Uh, there was a multi-province three-year study recently that showed that 75% of the patients that were referred to a respirology specialist waited more than 175 days for an appointment. We also know that uh, in 2021 alone, there were over 80,000 emergency department visits for uh, asthma-related uh, causes. Health systems are under immense strain, experiencing staff shortages, surgical and diagnostic backloads, mental health and addictions issues, as we've never seen before, among many other challenges. And of course, respiratory care continues to be impacted as a result of some of those broader health system challenges as well. Uh, the national organization that I described is Asthma Canada. We're in touch with patients and we're always uh, providing information and support and surveying patients. And what we're hearing is that they're finding that there's a lack of support for asthma management from allied health professionals, that there are long wait times as we referenced through some of the studies that were done as well. Uh, no, there's a need to ensure early identification of uncontrolled asthma at the primary care level. And there really is no pathway for people to receive care closer to home following emergency room visits. And Josh talked about how that was for him as a child where it was just this constant revolving door. And there are so many people who have severe and uncontrolled asthma in Canada who are going through that at this time. In addition to uh, Josh, I just wanna share a, a quick word about a, another patient story. Uh, this is someone named Amanda. And uh, I'll quote the, uh, the words of her uh, fiance, Gary Staples. He says, Amanda was healthy, outgoing, worked out every day, never missed a walk with her dog and her son. And uh, it was during one of those walks that he received a message from Amanda, a text message that simply said, I can't breathe. Amanda sadly passed away later that day uh, following an asthma attack. It, he goes on to say that while asthma was waiting for her in-person specialist appointment, she used her inhalers more frequently than any of us knew yet she was still having issues controlling her asthma. Unfortunately, she never made it to that specialist appointment. The day after we lost her in her mailbox was the appointment letter dated for two months from then. So really uh, a, a very sad outcome for Amanda. Uh, and, I don't, and I do wanna thank her fiance, Gary, and her dad, Ian, for 
also advocating on behalf of patients. They want to make sure that the future is better for patients and that Amanda's legacy will continue on through the work that we're doing. So the Delphi study itself, uh, we were part of, uh, uh, we were a participant in an expert steering committee that developed the first Canadian stakeholder consensus for the diagnosis, appropriate referral, and care for Canadians living with severe asthma. The study had involved more than 150 respiratory educators, respirologists, allergists, family physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and respiratory therapists from across the country to provide their perspectives and lay out a path for high quality respiratory care for, uh, for Canadians. Uh, so you'll see here on the screen a full list of the recommendations, the 10 uh, recommendations that uh, came out of this consensus study. Uh, and I'll just highlight on a couple of the themes that run throughout those. So one is exploring and investing in an enhanced role for respiratory therapists and certified respiratory educators, and in particular, working with primary care providers and supporting patients, resulting in better identification of severe asthma and uncontrolled asthma, and ultimately better management and control of the disease. Uh, this would also mean the proactive identification of uncontrolled asthma at that primary care level, which will help prevent exacerbations, which require emergency department visits and hospitalization. So again, going back to Josh's story, trying to break that cycle uh, by being more proactive. Well, the, one of the key recommendations also is to establish a consistent pathway for referral with clearly defined criteria and acceptable wait times. We know that people are simply waiting too long to see specialists. And uh, by dealing with more of these issues at a primary level, primary care level rather, we know that uh, we'll be able to help that situation. And then addressing the gaps in timely and acute referrals, accurate referrals rather to uh, specialists complying with a four to eight week optimal period. We don't know ultimately what Amanda's health outcomes might have been if she had seen a specialist sooner, but we have a pretty good indication that uh, she would still be with us here today if she had. So this, uh, in some cases, uh, is really um, sadly illustrated through stories like Amanda's across the country. And there are about 250 patients in Canada annually who pass away similarly to, uh, to Amanda uh, due to asthma exacerbations. So we know respiratory care is failing <clears throat> due to strain on the health system. We know that reform will take years, but these recommendations are some steps forward that we can take now. And we're actively involved in bringing these forward, not only through education sessions like today, but also through our advocacy efforts across the country as well. So what I'd like to do now is uh, go to a couple of questions for our panelists and I'll throw it out and please Susan, Sue and Josh, uh, please weigh in as you will uh, on each of these questions. But uh, the first one would be the Canadian Delphi consensus study highlights recommendations to address gaps in the asthma care system. From your perspective as a care provider or in Josh's case as a patient, what do you see, uh, which recommendations rather do you see from the study that really resonated with you and why? So maybe I'll start if that's okay. And Jeff, I just want to congratulate Jeff, whose story I've heard on a number of occasions, Josh, uh, only because really it highlights how much good asthma care can take place really prior to biologics and whatever else we advocate for in severe asthma. Even though it's all important, uh, there really are so many things that could be done in advance of that that have excellent outcomes. So uh, nice to hear your story again, Josh. Uh, I was part of this Delphi consensus, uh, Jeff, and what resonated with, with me was how close the experience was for all of us who are, you know, who were involved in the discussions. For me, a lot of patients take a long time before they come to see me. There's under recognition, there's under diagnosis. Uh, I think many in primary care and in emergency rooms who may be seeing these patients, and I should add, not everybody has a primary care physician. The notion of allergy being an important trigger for asthma really never goes on their radar. And that's why it's difficult sometimes for me to have access to these patients. They're just not referred. So under diagnosis, under recognition, 
And even if those things do take place, we all agreed on the Delphi panel that there just isn't enough uh, access to expertise. And expertise is not only specialists such as respirologists and allergists, but certainly all the important allied healthcare professionals like CREs and uh, respiratory therapists and nurses and other asthma educators who could certainly play a big role uh, prior to seeing the specialists. The three recommendations, which for me were most pragmatic and actionable, and that's what I looked for in Adelphi. What can we do uh, on a practical level? I think the recommendations about CREs uh, and respiratory therapists and other allied healthcare professionals filling this important gap, both in primary care, the level of the emergency room, being intermediary or working with the specialists, those are things that should be worked on and we're going to have to have support to institutionalize that a little bit better. Uh, you know, I'd like to see every patient who needs an emergency room uh, really having a direct referral at least to, uh, you know, uh, a certified respiratory educator uh, prior to the specialist to get the ball rolling or a nurse or anybody else with that sort of expertise. What I also appreciated was good criteria at the level of primary care. When do you refer? What are those benchmarks that you're looking at that tell you this person needs care beyond what's been offered already? When should they be referred? And you mentioned some of those already, Jeff. Uh, number of courses of uh, oral corticosteroids and emergency room visits. And lastly, again, benchmarks for when specialists should be assessing these types of patients. Once they need referral, is it appropriate to wait 174 days? And most of us agree that this is certainly way beyond anything that should happen. So there were some pragmatic benchmarks, which most of us agreed with. Four to eight weeks is probably what most did agree with. And all of these, I think, I found very helpful in providing practical advice for a go forward for this problem. Thanks, Susan. And, and before uh, Sue and or Josh uh, weigh in, I'll just mention that um, it, you can see at the bottom of the screen, we do have a reference to the study itself. You, If you're interested in reading the full study, if you go to asthma.ca and go into our re the research section of our website, you'll see there there's a link where you can download the full uh, report, the full article on the study. So I would encourage everyone to uh, to do that. Uh, but for now, we're, we're focused on obviously the these recommendations here. Um, Sue, Josh, any further thoughts in terms of what really resonated with you in, in the recommendations? Yeah, thank you. I I want to um, say that I agree with everything that Susan has been um, saying, and that I and and just to add to that, I do think that one of the largest gaps that exist is and it and it really encompasses uh, all of the recommendations is really to improve the integration and building of community partnerships and networks of asthma care providers. And, I, and I'm thinking of it from a sense of all encompassing. So from the ED providers to pharmacists, to primary care providers, specialists, educators, everyone. And really by improving this communication and working together, we can invest really in the prevention and so decrease the burden of acute care. And I feel like we tend to work in silos rather than how can we engage our key stakeholders with the existing infrastructure that we already have so that we can build these seamless pathways to diagnosis, education, and to the specialists. And I have to say, I'm a little bit biased as an educator that I, I also felt that the one that resonated with me the most was the um, access to receiving um, asthma education in the recommendations as an asthma educator, because I know that I have seen the positive impact that it can be made when you tailor asthma education to families and caregivers and that how it can make a difference in having the right management and education in a really very short period of time. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, Sue. Josh? Yeah, I 100% I agree with both Sue and, and Susan. I, I think first and foremost, you know, primary uh, care clinicians should proactively identify suspected severe asthma patients. I think that's first. Um, and of course, you know, all patients should receive education about their asthma from an asthma educator, because of course, it's not just the patients 
it's also the families of the patients who can help proactively with that, um, you know, through earlier detection of, of severe asthma. Um, it also comes the patient's triggers and, and they're specific to the patient. I think having a CRE uh, there to kind of help understand that and how you can eliminate or mitigate these, these triggers, you know, whether through elimination, substitution, uh, lifestyle changes, I think, I think that's key. Um, and, and could, uh, yeah, could, could, could really help an asthmatic and their family. And it could also help, uh, the amount of, um, ED visits from that, that patient, which I think, uh, I, th I think it's a, it's a snowball effect essentially. And I think you can only win. Yeah, for sure. Jeff, is it okay to add something, you sure. know, this relationship certainly with, you know, allied health and, and CREs and, and nursing and educators, these relationships are ongoing. There's so much that could be done, not only through in-person visits, but through that strategic phone call, uh, through that virtual visit, answering questions, telling people what, uh, you know, may work best under certain circumstances. You know, Amanda's story of not being able to breathe. I mean, if those symptoms were building over a long time, there could have been timely intervention even before that specialist came on board. So I think both Josh and Sue make very important points in that regard. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Susan. And, and also, you know, that there's... Um... Another theme that runs through, I think, a lot of the work that we do as a patient-facing fa organization is really educating patients so that they understand uh, that they need to have a voice as well. And so we try to provide resources and information that will help empower them. And uh, by having those pieces in place in terms of uh, respiratory educators and so forth, that will help, again, to empower patients, which is really important because someone like Amanda, for example, um, you know, may have, as many people do, downplayed their symptoms. It's just my asthma. In fact, someone who tried to help Amanda uh, when she was um, on that walk, when she text, uh, sent that text message to Gary, uh, she actually said that to him. Oh, you know, don't worry, it's just my asthma. And of course, we know that later that day she did pass away. So part of it is on, on the patient as well. And, and our obligation, obviously, as uh, a patient organization and as healthcare professionals is to make sure that the patients are educated and, and prepared as well. Uh, one of the things that really uh, resonated for me, I came in uh, into my role with Asthma Canada at the tail end, just before the Delphi uh, study was published and the recommendations were released. But um, really, it, it, one of the things that struck me was about how the recommendations uh, are, are encouraging pieces, existing pieces of the healthcare system to work together better for the benefit of patients. So you'll see one of the recommendations there references pharmacy. People are often in contact and, and especially with, as Susan mentioned, a, a lot of people don't have primary care physicians at this point in time. So their pharmacists and other healthcare professionals that they interact with are keys to their health as well. So having them and respiratory educators, primary care, all focused on the same page and delivering the same messages is really important and it's something that's that's realistic and pragmatic. So moving into uh, another question and perhaps uh, I'll ask uh, Sue, Sue B, sorry, we have Sue, Susan, it's, it gets a little confusing here, uh, but uh, it's estimated, as I mentioned earlier, that about a million uh, of the patients living with asthma in Canada are children. Uh, and many of them do end up in emergency departments for care. Many don't have access to respiratory care at the primary care level. And as Josh mentioned in his story, you know, he lived in a rural setting. His family uh, lived in an old farmhouse. They didn't realize that that environment was really contributing to some of the poor health outcomes that he was having as a child. Um, what would you say we could do better to ensure that children are diagnosed properly and in a timely fashion? And what would help ensure that those who are diagnosed as children are on a path to managing their disease, not only as children, but into adulthood as well. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, I really feel it's it's very similar to sort of what we had spoken about early, but it's about really the early recognition and early pathway to referral. Really, uh, you know, educating our community providers, whoever that may be of many different forms, that really, you know, when you have a child that has had two or more oral steroid courses that are responsive to wheeze with short-acting beta agonists, that there should be a referral made 
to someone if you're if you really don't understand sort of asthma quality uh you know quality care that there is a referral made there are many again this is where educators could be um, very well utilized it doesn't necessarily need to be to a specialist but then we can distinguish between that and then access to diagnostics this is another one and then having appropriate referral and again having I like to sort of think of it as a triangle of care. It's really something that we've tried to do. I can just use an example of sort of what we have done um, in our center where we have a pediatric asthma care and education clinic where there's high risk individuals identified. They are then um, uh, cared for by, there's an educator, you have access to diagnostics, we, um, which includes actually, Susan, you might be happy, which includes, this can include our allergy skin prick testing, looking at allergies as well, because it does evolve over time for, for children as well. And then having that triangle of care. So the ICU patients will go to severe asthma clinic after they've had that initial session, after four to six weeks of discharge, even from hospital. But then also then they may just need that education session, and then they can be discharged to our community partners and somewhere closer to home as well. And so having this sort of triangle of care is, I think, is extremely important. And again, opening up that communication. And then when you when there is a need, and then specifically to the severe asthma group, I think this is where the educators can really distinguish between are these are they able to, they're very good at mitigating any kind of modifiable factors. So can we determine what is the difficult to treat asthma because of modifiable, modifiable factors versus the ones that are really have truly severe asthma where they're on maximal therapy and they're really still not doing well. And then that access to that specialist can occur where we're able to phenotype. And then again, the access to the biologics purely because of age becomes a difficulty. And also we're just finding that there are some, some gaps with respect to uh, public versus uh, public payers versus private payers. And then in terms of for, um, for managing their disease and into, whole, in, 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 into adulthood, those transitions and again, those partnerships with those community people are extremely important. And that might be transitioning to an allergist or transitioning to um, a respirologist. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Susan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Sure, I will. Uh, and I, you know, uh, go on record that I'm not a card carrying pediatrician, Jeff and Sue. Uh, but, you know, as an allergist, I see a lot of pediatrics. And I think that over the years, we've really lent too much lip service to it all starts in childhood and then proceeded to ignore it. You know, based on good longitudinal data, the more exacerbations you have as a child, the more depression of your airflow and low FEV1 and spirometry abnormalities you have going forward. So exacerbations are a big predictor. Allergy is a predictor as to who retains uh, their asthma as an adult. All of these things, you know, should be looked at. And as Sue mentioned, what's modifiable is extremely helpful. Uh, PEDS is still responsible for a good number of the admissions that we see in this time of year. And I think that what people are uncomfortable with is that diagnostics are not readily available probably up until age five or six or whatever when spirometry could be done. Uh, and many of us probably don't have access to what Sue would have access to with sick kids. But often you have to build a circumstantial case you have a family history, you may or may not have allergy, you're triggered by the typical triggers of infection, et cetera. You respond to inhalers and to typical uh, asthma medications. These are the children that should be monitored and referred if it's a recurring situation. So they're not a group to be ignored. Thank you both for that. Uh, I have one more question that I'll throw out and then uh, I'll go, we'll go back to Chris and see if there are questions in the, uh, the Q and A and encourage people. If you have any questions, please uh, put them into the Q and A at this point. Um, so the final question that I'll ask is around uh, best practices. You know, this, some of this can seem uh, very daunting in terms, you know, where do we begin? How do we pull these pieces of the system together? How do we ensure that 
people at different levels of the system in primary care and pharmacy and so forth are working together uh, to enact uh, some of these recommendations. So are there best practices in Canadian jurisdictions or even perhaps globally that could help lay a path for addressing gaps in care? And Susan, Sue, I'll, I'll throw it out to you to cite any examples that you may have. Yeah. So maybe you have something that's best established at Sick Kids already as a model. I mean, I can draw on my own experience. We do have a severe asthma clinic, but again, these are the same sort of access problems that, you know, have been uh, probably identified in other jurisdictions. There's generally no easy way to get in there. Uh, the wait times are long and we still haven't beaten that problem. Uh, you know, we do have standards, we have good standards, but at the end of the day, uh, within the hospital that I work at, I would have to say that we still have the same access issues and we haven't yet sort of solved the problem of how access could make us more adherent to these standards. So uh, for me, nurse practitioners, CREs, this would be an excellent intermediary step or, or part of the healthcare team that would certainly be able, uh, you know, to help us uh, achieve all of these standards in good care. Right now, it's not there where I work. Basically, uh, you know, often we're not as timely as we would like to be, though we, uh, you know, bend over backwards to try and, you know, to, to meet people's needs. It's not as institutionalized as I'd like. Yeah, so I can add to that. I, I did allude to sort of sort of this triangle of care that we do have. Um, I know I, this is just, I, I know that there are others out there. The other one I want to mention is I know that in, um, I do, we do, when we did benchmarking for our severe asthma program, I did go out to uh, Alberta and Calgary has, and the Calgary um, system has, it's affiliated with Alberta Children's, and they have something called the Community Pediatric Asthma Service. Again, this is pediatric specific, and I'm sure that there are other ones out there as well. But it's a wonderfully um, integrated system, and, and it really involves all key stakeholders, um, both pediatricians in the community, the specialists, and then also the, the Community Pediatric Asthma Service, which they call the, the, the CPAS. And the CPAS is really, it's a group of educators that have access to diagnostics. And what I really liked about their system as well is that they had automated, a, they had an automated referral system in which there were specific referral pathways and guidelines to each of the um, areas. And the fact is that anyone could refer, a non-prescriber could refer. So for example, if you were a nurse in ED and you noticed that that you had someone that had come to emerge a couple times, they could automatically make a referral to the CPAS. And then there's a really wonderful integration of the community from community pediatricians, where the educators will go out to the community, provide education to their, um, um, you know, to their families. And then there also was always the very strong support to the specialist. And then this their severe asthma clinic had very specific guidelines with respect to the the type of um, you know families that they would see. So I feel like those type of things, um, and it's again, it's a, it's a very seamless transition to, to, that can occur. And then you know, even in severe asthma clinics, when someone becomes well controlled, that there would be that referral to the community partners that are able to understand asthma care, understand the quality um, guidelines, and be able to follow appropriately as well. I Great just model. want to add something Sorry, to that, ahead. Jeff, and I know that, you know, probably time is short. Um, it sounds like an excellent model. I know that in Alberta as well, they will send out educators and people, you know, will rotate amongst primary care to do this. It just brings to mind two things. Number one, we have to be good advocates. A lot of our certified respiratory educators used to be in hospitals. They no longer are. These people require support. They need to be well positioned. The care paths from eMERGE, primary care, whoever needs to refer should be well established. So we do need to advocate to get these people supported and to bring them back onto the landscape. I think it's extremely important. And we have to gather better data. A few of us.
us in Ontario will do it, but in terms of outcomes, steroid use, hospitalizations, eMERGE visits, we do need that, uh, as well as the pharmacoeconomics of that, to build our case why good care is so important, not only for the quality of life, but really for the community at large. Yeah, I just wanted to add one final comment. Just, um, you know, asthma is a chronic disease, and I do feel that we should be resourced and funded um, appropriately and really to focus on the on the prevention piece, because with a little bit of short term investment, we can have a long term, we can have long term gain with real significant in reduction in um, health burden. Absolutely. Thank you both for that. And one thing I'll just say quickly before we go over to Chris is um, there is a, another model that I wanted to mention that's uh, operating in Southwestern Ontario, Best Care. Some of you would be familiar with it uh, under the direction of Dr. Chris Lischka. Uh, they have um, certified respiratory educators embedded in the family health teams in the area within uh, Windsor, Essex, Sarnia, London, Middlesex County, that area. And uh, it's a really interesting model that's evolving and growing and something that we, I think, can point to as a great model for us going forward as well. So thank you for that. And I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Chris, for any uh, Q&A questions. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. Um, so we do have a number of, of great questions and probably we won't have time to get to them all. So we'll be a bit selective with, uh, with the ones I choose. Um, one question uh, we have from an audience member is, what and how can community CREs best support children with suspected asthma when under five and unable to do spirometry? Uh, would it just be education or are there any other tests that could be done? So, Susan? Yeah, so sure. You mentioned, yeah, the diagnostics in this very young age group. Uh, so start and then I'm happy to pick it up from there. Yeah, I know one of the things that we have been um, doing, I think, is uh, we're, we're, we also we look at lab work with respect to phenotyping as well. And I think one of the things with uh, children is that they do evolve over time. Um, we've been also trying to do preschool spirometry um, at Sick Kids as well. Um, we and a while ago, we don't do it anymore. We also didn't, we did this with the child study as well. We, we did infant pulmonary function as well and looking at things longitudinally. So I, those are, I mean, those are diagnostics. They're not readily available everywhere, but um, I think that, I think they're important. And, and I do think that uh, in younger, I think, I think, I don't know, Susan, you can, you can, you can weigh in on this, but we do do allergy screen prick testing in young children, and we have seen positive responses, and that are also helps significantly with our management as well. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was going to mention the child study. Childhood spirometry was predictive and able to be done as part of that study. Unfortunately, there's very little in the way of specific pulmonary diagnostics in the very young uh, at least none that are available unless we do have a point of care, eosinophilic uh, activation test that seems to be coming down the road. But look, we build this, you know, a, uh, a circumstantial case for pediatrics often. I look at comorbidities. Do they have eczema? Do they have food allergy? Are they skin test positive? What is their environment like? Do they have specific triggers like respiratory infection? How do they respond to inhalers? And we put together our best case scenario and we treat them as if they are asthmatics, uh, even though they don't have definitive spirometric evidence of it. So that's my approach to it uh, in the very young. They are a challenge. Yeah, they are. And they, I think the approach that we take, especially coming from a severe asthma clinic, is that if you have a child that is getting oral steroid doors or oral steroid courses ending up in eMERGE or hospitalized, what is the harm in increasing the, their inhaled medications and add-on therapy? Because what we're trying to do is really trying to prevent those episodes from happening. You know, the yep. oral steroids can cause much more harm rather than increasing their, um, you know, baseline medications. And that I think is the important education piece. Parents are naturally very suspicious of steroids, both oral and inhaled. Often there's a lot of negotiation, even though the benefits for inhalers far outweigh the risks. 
so we're actually just about at time now. So we do have some other great questions, but we'll we'll leave it there and see if we can uh, follow up on these questions subsequently. So uh, Jeffrey, thank you for hosting a great panel. Susan, Sue, Josh, thanks so much for, for your wonderful insights. Um, this was sort of the best of all worlds because it was a great conversation and I barely had to do any work. So, uh, so much the better. Um, so thanks so much, everyone. Uh, for, for all of the folks watching right now, please remember to complete the evaluation of this uh, of this session to help us improve uh, and shape our event next year. Uh, our next session is going to start soon. If you haven't already done so, you can register for it, register for it under the schedule tab on your homepage. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week here at Better Breathing. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.